read the lines. Okay, um, can everybody can everybody hear okay? Thank you to, for coming to Research Forum today. We have a new techno, technical option here that's shown up on the screen, and that is we want to poll the audience, and we'll have a few questions. This is just an intro question, and the way you do this is you can either go to that uh, the web link that's shown there, or text DCRI Research 803 um, to that number, 37607, and then you'll get the option to respond about who you are and what your background is. So we welcome that, and uh, we hope that this polling will further enhance the kind of the interactivity of these uh, events. But uh, I'm really pleased today to talk with you and with our colleagues who work together about the Odyssey Outcomes Trial. I'll say that we're not able to present the results of the study that were presented recently at, at a scientific conference because the manuscript is under review at a major journal and we're not able to go through the trial results. But I think more importantly, what we want to talk about today is how we worked as a team to execute a complicated trial and what we learned by doing that. And I think everybody here will, will, will benefit from getting that knowledge. And I'll say that um, this has been a six-year journey. If we know that the, um, the story, the um, ancient Greek story, the Odyssey, it was like a 30-year journey. When we, when we began this trial, we actually thought maybe it will take 30 years, but it only took us six years to complete it. So it's appropriately named Odyssey. And I was just talking to Kirby that um, the Odyssey that we've had for this trial parallels the birth and growth of my youngest daughter. So it's been interesting to watch that. And sometimes in a big trial, you go through the processes of birth, then crawling, then stumbling around and walking, and then learning how to walk, and then becoming more self-aware, then throwing tantrums, and then learning how to behave well. So I think that all happened in the context of this trial, and it's been great and fun. And there are a lot of people at DCRI who contributed, and we're going to recognize everyone today for their contributions and share those learnings. And uh, Kirby Quintero will, will speak. She's a project leader in the Mega Trials group, whom I started working with 25 years ago, I think. And uh, unfortunately for us, but good for Kirby, she's retiring in a few months. I don't want her to retire because she's so great to work with that I'll miss her dearly, but she's earned her retirement. So I think Kirby deserves a big round of applause. And uh, we, we hope that during retirement, she'll have a chance to have fun and no one will be complaining to her. Um, Lynn Perk. Lynn Perkins has been the project leader from the CEC group. Lynn, how many years have you been at DCRI? Almost 18. 18 years. Um, and uh, it's been phenomenal working together with Pier Luigi Tricocci, who's the CEC PI, who's been on faculty at DCRI and Duke for 10 years. So you're looking at collectively a team of people who have tremendous experience, and uh, that's shown in how we executed the trial. So Kirby will first speak about um, how we ran the trial from an operational perspective and the lessons that were learned from that. Then Pier Luigi and Lynn will speak about how we did the same for the CEC, which was part of this trial, but also part of a bigger program of trials all under the Odyssey program umbrella. And uh, then we'll have a moderated discussion at the end. So we hope you'll have questions. We hope this to be interactive, and there'll definitely be plenty of time to address your questions and provide answers to those. So with that in mind, I'll introduce Kirby Quintero to... Oh, that's right. I'm going to do the first slides. That's right. I forgot about that. All right. Okay. So um, this trial, is, you know, you look at this long title, and uh, it basically is a trial of a novel lipid-lowering drug in patients who had a recent acute coronary syndrome. But we can never get, like, very simple titles anymore. One of my ideas for pragmatic trials is the title should only be a certain number of words and other things. But um, this was a... Uh, typical large cardiovascular outcomes trial. Uh, I'm not sure if you can read all this in the back, but it basically was taking patients who had a recent acute coronary syndrome, a heart attack or unstable angina, within four to 52 weeks after their event, and they, were, they had to be treated with optimal statin therapy, which are lipid-lowering drugs that we treat patients with routinely who have heart disease. And then if their lipid values were still elevated, for example, if their LDL value was above 70 despite optimal statin therapy and a few other things, they would then be eligible for the study and could be randomized. And they were randomized to this drug called alirocumab, which is a drug known as a PCSK9 inhibitor. 
which is a monoclonal antibody injected subcutaneously that augments the LDL lowering that you see with a statin. So it was used together with a statin versus placebo. And patients were followed for a minimum of two years. And uh, when we look at uh, the DCRI responsibilities, Kirby's going to go through this. She's going to show the proportional enrollment and other things of the study so you can see that. And uh, I'll hand the baton over to her at this point. Okay, so um, for the for Odyssey outcomes, um, it was unique in that the mega trials team and the CEC had two separate contracts, two different scopes of work. So I'm going to go over the mega trial scope of work and responsibilities, and then Lynn and Pierre Luigi will speak to the CEC responsibilities. Um, our responsibilities were faculty thought leadership site management and monitoring in North America. We had 300 sites. And we partnered with the Canadian Vigor Center um, for site management and monitoring. That's something that we do um, routinely on these large clinical trials. So our processes are very streamlined and seamless. Um, the CVC works with our clinical trial management system. They follow our SOPs and um, they use our trip reports. So very, very easy and good partnership that we have with our Canadian partners. Um, we d were responsible for management of the National Coordinating Committee and the AROs, Study Coordinator Steering Committee, which we'll talk a little bit about, and um, the creation and distribution of patient and site materials, including a global newsletter. So these are the topics that I'll go over um, as I go through this prese presentation. So we had a lot of firsts, um, our DCRI team did. Um, we were the first site activated in the US. We um, screened the first patient, we randomized the first patient, and we were the top enrolling country in the trial. Um, 2,500 patients we enrolled plus. We had 10 patients that were lost to follow-up and 17 patients that with, withdrew consent. So our loss to follow-up rate was 0.4%. So not only were we the top enrolling country for this study um, with 2,511 patients, um, the next highest enrolling country was Russia. And you see there they had 1,109 patients. So we um, enrolled more than double um, the next enrolling country. So um, for startup, um, startup was driven by um, availability of study drug at the start of the trial. I don't know if you have worked on a trial where the sponsor comes to you and says, hey, yeah, here's the protocol. Take your time. Get the patient enrolled whenever, whenever you get things worked out. <laughs> no, never works that way, right? So um, study drug was available October 5th. It was at the site October 8th. And um, we screened our first patient October 11th. Well, how that happens is we get a group of sites together. We call them Greyhound sites. They're sites known to us um, that are really good sites that have a quick enrollment or a quick startup process, and they have access to a pretty vast ACS population. So we get them involved in being the group of sites that's going to enroll the first, the first patient. There's competition. Um, there's some trash talking, and it's a lot of fun, and we all work really hard together to get that first patient enrolled. It's always an exciting time when you get that first patient enrolled. Then um, how enrollment went was we activated sites quickly. Um, we were able to exceed all our site activation um, enrollment metrics, and um, so enrollment followed 
quickly as soon as you know if you get sites activated quickly then you're going to get your enrollment going quickly thereafter we did close sites that did not screen or enroll um, that's always very difficult to do because the site and your team invest a lot of time and energy to get sites activated and the last thing you want to do is have to close them. And they don't get the financial payment of enrolling patients, so it's costly to the sites and to you. So it's not something we want to do, but it makes sense in the end. And the last thing you want to happen is to um, have the site enroll one patient. And then you limp along the whole study with that one patient. So um, the protocol was amended in the first year. Um, we expanded inclusion criteria from 12 weeks to 52 weeks. That, of course, helped enrollment. Um, we worked with the ACC registry to try and identify eligible patients. Um, that was not successful for this study. The ACC registry, the ACC was unable to sort of fine tune their reports so that um, we were able to use them to um, identify eligible patients. It just wasn't as fine-tuned as it needed to be. Pardon me? The reports um, did go to sites, but they were just not specific enough that the patients, none of the patients met the criteria when you dug deeper into the uh, inclusion criteria. Um, I wouldn't say that it wouldn't work for any study, it just didn't work specifically for us. Um, we tried providing additional funding for screening. Um, sometimes it, you think if you can give the sites more money for more resources, that's going to help your screening. We had a mixed impact there. We had some sites that um, did seem to be affected by the increased um, money, but um, it's really hard to identify which sites those are going to be. So really the recommendation is to include adequate funding for everybody. It takes a village. This is our team. <laughs> we had 35 team members um, at DCRI on Odyssey Outcomes for the um, U.S. site management and monitoring. We had 18 in-house CRAs. We had 12 on-site CRAs. And the way that works is um, because in these large mega trials, you're doing reduced monitoring, risk-based monitoring, these sites only get visited like twice a year. So um, because of that, the in-house CRAs are the primary contact for the sites. We had some terrific leads on this study, Anita Heptich, Janessa. Jessica Stibe um, were the leads over the in-house team, and Deanna Sidlowski over the um, on-site CRA remote monitoring team. And um, Danny, Underwood, Danny Underwood worked with us periodically as needs arose. She's a senior CRA. Um, Want to have a shout out to Mike Blazing, who worked with us. Um, he had just come off improve it and so um, he was the perfect fit for our study um, long follow-up study on a cholesterol lowering drug he was a great asset to the team and we put him to work talking to a lot of sites and principal investigators about their responsibilities these are the academic research organizations we worked with we worked with eight academic research organizations um, the CVC in Canada did site management and monitoring. The other um, AROs did more advisory um, uh, responsibilities, and they were brought in if there were issues with the sites that um, couldn't be addressed by the um, sponsors team. So um, these are the responsibilities for the academic research organization. Um, they provide feedback and startup um, on the protocol, site selection, assistance with regulatory, uh, regulatory submissions, 
participate in investigator meetings. Um, then as far as enrollment, they serve as an um, advisor, um, review country-specific issues, liaison with in-country sponsor um, affiliates and CRAs. And that's really the key in this model to success is the relationship that they have with the in-country um, team because they have to be able to um, bring the issues to the ARO. So those two have to have a really good relationship. As far as communication goes, they conducted um, routine teleconferences with all the sites and um, escalated issues to the executive steering committee. They also supported the local team efforts to ensure data quality. So if you have an ARO that's responsible for data quality, you want to be sure they have input on site selection. Why use an ARO? 40% of the overall enrollment in the study was um, by ARO countries. So that shows the impact that the AROs could really have in this um, trial. Brazil was um, number three top enrolling country. Argentina was in the top 10. Study coordinator steering committee was something else we managed. Um, the um, study coordinators were identified by the regional country managers um, from the sponsor. Um, we had quarterly teleconferences. We discussed pertinent issues. And if you want to know what's going on on the ground with your trial, having a study coordinator steering committee will provide the feedback of what it's like to enroll in these trials and complete data and use your materials. Um, one of the innovative ideas that we did for this study was we worked very closely with the outcomes group to set up a call center. We used this for um, non-compliant sites that we had to close so that we could transfer the patient somewhere and continue follow-up. Um, this is really important because you have a site with GCP issues um, you think it's really best to close them, um, but you're worried you're going to lose the vital status on all these patients. You'll have no follow-up. You can transfer the patients to another site. That transfer site has to be close, and they have to be a good site to take on more responsibility. And then what happens is you might have a site with mediocre enrollment, and you've transferred you know, a large volume of patients to that new site now. And now they're one of the top enrolling centers in your trial. And now they're on the target list for an FDA audit. So those just don't add up to good things. <laughs> so we needed a, another way that would lessen the risk to all to follow these patients. And so we came up with the call center. They had a limited scope. They only followed patients from the time they were transferred to them. They didn't have anything to do with the data that was done before that. And um, we had consent obtained. And this was all approved by the local IRB as well as the Duke IRB. And there, in the end, we had 32 patients, and we were able to get follow-up on 23 which is fantastic. It's a really good answer. OK. <laughs> it shows, shows the results. <laughs> OK. Um, so the question is, how many queries did Odyssey Trial have in the last year in the US? And the numbers are. Um, 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, or 150,000. And so you use your cell phone to enter your answer. We need to have like the Wheel of Fortune. Here. Yeah, I know. Well,
well, we sort of, we're pretty close here. Um, so there were more than 100,000 queries in the last year. This is only in the US, more than 100,000 queries. And then overall total, I think Jess had added it up, it was like 450,000. So this was pretty much average. Um, so we weren't using data management here at DCRI. And um, I've worked here long enough to know how great our reports are here at DCRI and data management, and they can't be matched by anybody else, believe me. So um, when you don't have access to those wonderful reports and you're not working with DCRI, then um, how do you adapt to the sponsor's process? Well, um, first thing we did was provide some realistic goals um, to the sponsor in that if you're going to generate, you know, 8,000 to 10,000 queries a month, you know, if you take a status report at any point in time, it's not going to be zero. I mean, as long as that many patients or queries are generated, you're going to have a large number of queries outstanding at every, any one point in time. So we told them, you're not going to see the drop until the end of the trial. Until you stop creating these queries, there won't be a significant drop. But what we could do was address the queries greater than 30 days. And that's what we did. I mean, it, it's incredible work here to see that almost 14,000 queries were generated, and we had 208 greater than 30 days. And here, 165 greater than 30 days. So that was a lot of work that was done to keep the data current. That was the best we could do. So we also took advantage of real-time reports from RAVE, and we did increase our resources. So these are the database um, lock timelines. And at first glance, OK, so we're going to see 18,000 patients in 30 days. So these were, these were the deadlines for us. Um, and then um, how was that going to happen? A lot of planning. So we started communicating these timelines in April of 2017. And keep in mind, not only is it 30 days, it's over Thanksgiving. And we have 2,511 patients that need to be seen. So what we did was we collected um, visit dates um, starting in the summer. And what that told us was not only getting those patients scheduled, but it told us who were potential loss to follow-up patients. That was critical so that we could intervene early. And you see these timelines down to the bottom here, database lock the 24th of January. Um, the data cut was done the 25th of January. We made all these timelines, which are absolutely unbelievable. I'm not going to go through all these in detail, but just to say, um, with loss to follow up and withdrawal consent, um, the key was the advanced planning that we did, identifying those patients who are potential loss to follow up. And then we um, intervened from the very beginning. You know, a lot of times what you do is you have your final visits, and then after three months, you realize I have 200 loss to follow up patients. Well, we knew or predicted who they were from the beginning. So we got the patient locator service working on that on day one. We did everything um, from day one. We didn't wait for the sites to try and find the patients. We put in all other um, services and processes we possibly could from the beginning so that when we got to these tight timelines, we would have identified the patients. And um, also, it sounds silly, but just making sure everybody understands loss to follow up and withdrawal consent and what that really means. And so you might say a patient who's withdrawn consent, um, you know, is pretty simple. 
but is a patient with drawn consent that says they don't want anything to do with the trial, and then at the end of the day says, oh, but yeah, you can call me um, for the final visit. Well, that's not really a withdrawal consent patient. The other thing is for the site, we had this happen more than once. The site insists the patient has withdrawn consent. And then on further discussion, the study coordinator says, yeah, but I know he's alive because we see him in clinic on a routine basis. Well, if the patient was so angry or so upset with the trial that he didn't want anything to do with the trial, he didn't want to come to any visits, it's a little strange that he'd be coming to clinic on a routine basis. So then, as we talk to the site, um, it turns out that the patient would not mind giving vital status at the end of the study. So those are the kind of details that you really have to work through um, to limit your lost follow-up and withdrawal consent. And the rest is history. This is the um, Odyssey team, some of the Odyssey team um, from DCRI. Hi, everyone. I'm Lynn. I'm going to speak to this part of the CEC presentation, and then I'll let uh, Pierluigi wrap it up. So we had a strong leadership team within the CEC group. Um, Pierluigi Tricocci was our principal investigator and our executive committee. Uh, I was the project leader. Uh, Jill Marcus was our lead uh, clinical trials coordinator. And Renata Lopez was our CEC faculty director. This is the CEC ops team. Um, it, we had um, many coordinators. And we finished strong with uh, five full-time coordinators that worked on the study. And we had some additional help from the team in order to meet those type timelines that Kirby shared with you. Um, I'd like to recognize the team by having them stand up. And if, even if you worked on the study and your name is not here, please uh, feel free to stand so everyone can recognize you. So we're going to do another poll. So we saw from Kirby's slide that we had over 18,900 patients worldwide randomized into the study. How many potential clinical events do you think we received in CEC? We've got uh, 0 to 1,000, 1,000 to 5,000, 5,000 to 10, and then over 10,000. Give it another minute. I saw that. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> okay, we can stop then. It looks like um, the majority of the group, 60, about 60%, um, guessed correctly. We had over 10,000 potential events. We received actually 13,518. And you can see the breakdown by event type here. We did, our, our, our um, physicians did over 20,000 phase one reviews. So remember, uh, if you're not familiar with CEC, a phase one review is where we assign an event to two independent physicians. They adjudicate it, record the results, and then if their results don't match, we send it to committee. So you can see the last bullet point there. We had 182 committee meetings since 2012, and their committee meetings totaled over 200 or almost 250 hours in total. So a lot of um, time for the physicians to sit together and, and adjudicate those events. Here where, here's a, a snapshot of the world and where our reviewers came from. So we had um, um, a, a big cohort, of course, of um, DCRI and Duke faculty. We also had uh, used the Brazilian Clinical Research Institute, BCRI. We had reviewers from there. We collaborated with Stanford University and Kim Mahaffey. Um, and we also um, had a couple, and we also had the Canadian Vigor Center, as Kirby had mentioned, as well, um, led by Sean Goodman. 
And then we had independent reviewers that were from various countries around the world. Uh, we had um, two from France, um, Dr. Leonardi from Italy. He did a, a large portion of our, of our events. And we also had Connie Hess, who used to be at, the, at Duke and is now at the Colorado Prevention Center. So a lot of reviewers, a lot of collaboration between those reviewers. Did it freeze? OK. Here we go. So we used all faculty. We didn't use any fellows for this study. That was Sanofi's request. Uh, we had 33 cardiology faculty. We had three neurology fa uh, faculty members. And then we, Odyssey is actually a program. We are speaking today about the outcome study. Um, but we also had approximately nine smaller studies that were considered non-outcome studies. And we used the same, um, the same adjudication forms, the same charter um, definitions, the event definitions. And we used the same reviewers across the entire program. We had um, a great improvement of metrics. So these are what we call uh, mostly our site metrics, because you can see here we're looking at event date to when we actually received the event. So this shows you the delay in the site reporting of an event. We use trigger to packet complete. So those are our CEC packets that we're speaking to. And that is when we received the event to when we had enough source documents and all the queries have been responded to in order for us to complete the adjudication. And reviewers signed to adjudication complaints. So that's how long it took the reviewers in, in number of days to actually adjudicate the event. And then our last phase one and phase two, right, the entire. So it went from, um, it went to assign to a reviewer to complete. And then we also had event date to case complete. So this was a very in, a great interest to the sponsor because they want to know how to plan for database lock based on when did the event occur and when would we be finished with it. And, and I did three different snapshots here from March of 2015, 16, and 17. I have an asterisk on the 2016 benchmark because um, that was right at the time we were doing our first interim analysis. And so the timelines got much shorter, as you can see. We went from a mean number of a days of 107 from event date to case complete to down to 78 right before the interim analysis. So you saw a big change. And the reason the timelines got a little bit lengthier for March of 2017 is because the patients were on a different visit schedule, and so they weren't coming in as frequently. And, and they, they, they had a little bit of fatigue, I could admit, from interim analysis one and two were in there. And so that kind of led to some of the timelines slowing down. But obviously, based on the timelines that Kirby showed you for our lock timelines, we were able to get everyone to pick up the pace and, and complete CEC um, on time. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Dr. Chakoti, and he will finish the slide. Uh, thank you, Lynn. And so um, this is a slide that I think we, uh, as a CEC group, we are very proud of. You could see the uh, event received in purple and the event adjudication in, in blue. You could see that all, over the course of the trial, we were caught up con almost constantly on our 95% complete completion at each time point. Uh, and actually, if you could see two important milestones for the trial, which is are the two interim analysis, we did an interim analysis, um, the first one um, with 99.2% uh, completion of CC, and the second interim analysis at 99.7% completion. If you have done clinical trial in CEC, you know those numbers are pretty impressive uh, for an, a trial that size uh, and without many events and a lot of patients still uh, still coming in. And I think uh, um, the the reason we wa we were successful was really uh, a teamwork starting at uh, the site, trying to get the documents that were needed for adjudication and then processed internally uh, in, within our CEC group to uh, get ready for the adjudication, try to meet uh, every weekly meeting timelines and make sure that the reviewer were on track. We, we gave uh, reviewers five days to, to turn the phase one uh, cases. 
And, and every time a week we had a, a committee meeting and we tried to have all the phase one adjudication completed before the next uh, committee meeting. This was a way that we were able to keep track and stay, um, stay caught with adjudication. And, and actually, uh, usually uh, at the end of the trial, it's really frantic when you're close to uh, database lock. There's a lot of things going on. People get crazy. But for this trial, literally, the two weeks prior uh, to the database lock, we have literally any work to do because everything was already uh, already done uh, without any any rush, uh, just as a regular uh, regular work. So I'm going to spend some um, some time talking about some of the. Uh, key or unique things about the Odyssey CEC. Uh, first of all, one thing that I think was very, very important to have a, a connection between the CEC leadership and the trial leadership. And that was uh, um, um, one of the key aspects of this was uh, being part of the executive committee. So uh, uh, I represent the CEC in the executive committee. So I was able to communicate about the progress here, directly the concern uh, from the sponsor, from the uh, study chairs and, 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 and try to um, you know bring the issue that needed to be, be brought back home uh, so that I felt that was very very important also uh, lean um, attended the executive committee meeting so to provide an operational update and also hear um, any potential operational issue also one thing we did uh, um, it's to provide a set um, standard uh, a set uh, um, uh, slide set with metrics that we were uh, we've been sharing at all the committee meeting for the entire duration of the trial, so that uh, it was easier for everyone else to look at the progress of the of the CEC during uh, during uh, the trial. So, uh, Lean and Jill were attending regular call with. Uh, um, the uh, study co-chairs uh, and, and provide an update. So I think that integration with the trial leadership was very, very important. Um, this is an example of the the standard metric that we shared with the executive committee. We had the overall uh, progression, the completeness, the uh, the number of cases that we were receiving any mo every month with uh, uh, the number of events that we completed every month, uh, then a, a table with uh, e the total number of events, the percent completion, and where each of those events were, were at. So it was phase one, verse two, we were waiting for query resolution. And then some of the time metric that Lynn, uh, Lynn just shared to you were also uh, routinely shared with the, with the executive committee and the study chairs. Um, so uh, in we talk about quantity, but also we care a lot about quality of the of the um, of in the in the adjudication. So we we had several uh, quality control mechanism in place to make sure that the adjudication were done according to the definition, and uh, um, there was any loophole we could close those. Uh, f obviously, the f the one of the QC. Um, QC um, uh, effort was the standard QC, so where you pull a random number of cases uh, and you re-review in a blinded fashion and to see if the initial adjudication matched with the with the uh, with the second. We did a, a total of four QC um, during the life of the trial, a total of 140 event re-reviewed, and we end up with a disagreement uh, on major disagreement rates. So meaning a primary point occurred, yes, according to uh, the first adjudication versus no uh, during the QC adjudication or vice versa. And, uh, um, and all the, the major disagreements were re-reviewed re re by me uh, with Jill and to see if there was any systematic error or was just because that case was complicated or dif difficult to assess, one could go, could go either way. So we focus a lot of consist on consistency adjudication. Um, so um, in, in CC, some say that it's, it's better to be consistently wrong that uh, just sometime wrong and sometime right. So consistency is very important. The way you approach the case and review the cases uh, um, to, needs to be done <coughs> always in the same way. In, that, in the trial like this with this volume and also this a uh, large number of reviewers, we had like 40 reviewers, that, that was another aspect to really uh, focus on. And um, so we, we, uh, we spent a lot of time doing review uh, uh, training of reviewers. Um, um, also, we, we made sure, because the committee meeting uh, is a place where uh, some of the discussion about how 
cases should be adjudicated occur. So we always make sure that one of the senior leadership of the CEC was at the committee meeting. So uh, it was me in the majority of cases, but you know, um, when I was not available, I asked Renato Lopez to chair the committee meeting, and 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 some of those also Matt helped with that. So that was also to have uh, some uh, some person in the leadership of the trial that was uh, making sure that uh, the adjudication was done was done mm, was done consistently. Also, we had a pretty strong group of uh, physician that attended the, a lot of the committee meetings. And for example, Umberto Moriera from, uh, from Brazil, he was one of the most more strongest reviewers, Sergio Leonardi, but also some of the, our internal reviewer here, like uh, Matthew, Robin, uh, Tom Povsik, David Kong, and other, they were very, 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 very helpful. So, um, Oh, in addition to the standard QC, what we did is also some added checks to, again, see that the, con the adjudication were done consistently. Um, showing some example here. One that is, I think, very, very important uh, that we did is uh, reviewing, <coughs> re -review identifying and reviewing cases uh, where there was a positive troponin, but the adjudication was um, was negative. So because was saying there was not an MI. So uh, all those cases were flagged and re-reviewed the committee because uh, there, particularly uh, nowadays with a very, very sensitive troponin, there is a, a potential for a lot of subjective assessment of whether a troponin elevation was an MI, was something else. So again, we wanted to make sure that there was a consistent approach how those were handled. That's why those, uh, those cases were flagged and re-reviewed at committee to, to ensure, ensure the, uh, the consistency. And, and particularly in those cases that are, we define as a type 2 MI, which are essentially troponin elevation in the setting on other conditions um, so that our, we are able to detect more and more frequently nowadays. Uh, other uh, edit check we did was uh, looking at cases where uh, the reviewer said the patient died because had an MI, but then there was no MI adjudicated. So those were an example of cases that were flagged in the review say if they're to make sure that there was a, a um, correct thought process from the, uh, the reviewer point of view. Uh, I mentioned uh, one of the challenge in during the, the review adjudication uh, <coughs> was the type 2 MI. So again, uh, for those who are not in the, um, don't have medical background, the type 2 MI are so heart attack, instead of being caused by a blockage, are actually caused by a stressful situation of the heart, like for example, an infection or, <coughs> or, things, like, or things like that. So don't, not the classic uh, plaque that mm, with a clot to cause the heart attack. So now, nowadays we have a lot of uh, very sensitive assay to detect myocardial infarction, particularly the, the uh, high sensitivity troponin, which we have seen this trial uh, very, very largely used outside the, the United States, when the United States has just recently be, been approved uh, for clinical um, use. So, and then there's been a challenging one, is differentiating the type 1 MI, so the regular standard MI versus type 2 MI, but even potentially more Mm, challenging and, and, and critical, I would say, for the result of the trial is to differentiate the, the MI, type 2 MI versus patient who did not have an MI and had something else going on. And we had always a lot of discussion about elevated troponin in setting of heart failure. Was that an MI? Was that just heart failure? So those were some of the challenges we encountered. Another issue uh, was uh, when you have a type 2 MI, you assume that there is something else that is causing this uh, myocardial infarction, it could be an infection, for example. And as you probably, as you know, um, there is a lot of scrutiny now about missing safety uh, event. And, and so when you have a, a type 2 MI, there is a possibility there, may, there might be a, an SAE and uh, that has not been reported because sometimes the sites, because the uh, <clears throat> in some of the trials, this big trial, uh, there is a uh, waiver to report SAE, so they just they report an endpoint, but they will not report a C. So let's say you have a pneumonia and then an MI, then what happens many times, the site just report the MI and they think they've done with it, but uh, actually they also have to report the, the, uh, the pneumonia that goes under a separate um, review process. So actually um, our group and uh, um, with the leadership of Renato, they did a, a re-review of those type 2 MI, try to understand uh, if there were missed SAE 
in those type 2 MI and those in, in those cases the sites uh, were, were queried. And finally, um, one other, um, another um, type of information that's becoming more and more um, um, important, relevant, uh, we're getting more and more scrutiny on the CC process, say, when you say an event uh, did not occur, was that because uh, the event, the endpoint definition were not met? Or just because you didn't have in information um, to say that there was an event, so you have missing information, that's why you say no. And now um, there is, an, uh, again, an increased scrutiny uh, about this. So we put up actually a, a process in place uh, up front where actually we were asking in the adjudication form to each reviewer, when they said no to an event, the event did not occur, um, and, and, and we focused on the primary point event, which were uh, microarm function stable angina, stroke, uh, and, uh, and that due to coronary heart disease. Um, so we, uh, every time they, they said no to those events, we, uh, we asked them, did you say no because um, you know, the endpoint definition uh, were not met, or uh, did you have sufficient information to, to make that call? And, and in some cases, they were, there was some discrepancy, um, and those were resolved uh, 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 at committee. There, there also was some subject interpretation on the amount of, of uh, documentation needed. Um, and, uh, and when the reviewer uh, indicated that there was no um, sufficient information, then uh, the case went back to the site management group and to try to see if we could find that information. Then when their information were found, with the case was uh, going back to the um, to the committee for, for re-review. So um, though that's my last slide. So again, um, working in the Odyssey uh, trial has been a, a, a fantastic experience. It's been a, a great working with uh, all the DCR team, uh, the mega trial group, the CEC group, uh, but also with other um, investigators, the, the, our big group of reviewers, and executive committee and study chair, and I think uh, at the end we create a, a strong collaboration, uh, which I think uh, was one of the reasons why this trial was successful. Thank you. So we're going to do a moderated discussion here, so um, I'll invite my colleagues to come up here. So um, first of all, uh, we, want, we want this to be open to questions from the audience. So um, this group that did a great job with their presentations is here to answer your questions. If I have a few, but I'll, I'll uh, go from the audience first. So Carolyn, um, do we have a roving mic? Here we go. Kirby, you talked about a patient locator service and also predicting which patients might be lost to follow up. Um, is that something standard that we do on trials or is that something new that you implemented? So we've been using the particular service that we use is Delve. I can't tell you how many years we've been using them, but we've been accident, guests arrested, they have access yeah. to that. So it's a spot in time um, that they're looking for. Even if the patient's on social media and they can find that if it's publicly available. So yeah. Yeah. there are ways to find patients. And they, I think of the patients that we had 230 patients or potentially lost a follow-up, I think 60 or 70 were found by Dell. Right, right. Yeah. The majority of patients are found by the sites. And um, one of the very most successful things that um, you can do for your study is get one of your study coordinators who's found a patient, talk about what they did to find the patient because it's really persistence that pays off. And for example, one of our study coordinators, steering committee members spoke during a meeting about how she had tried and tried all the tried and true things, sending you know the FedEx envelope and all that to try and get them to respond to that. But um, in the end, she sent them a, just a postcard and said, just want to know you're doing OK. If you could drop me a line, let me know you're doing OK. And sure enough contacted them. So it's just strictly persistence. Yeah. It, it's a lot of manual effort, but there were times when Delve made contact with the patient and the site was telling us that, that they couldn't contact the patient, so we played each other off of them and uh, 
then the, we'd say the site would find them. And one time, I called up a site coordinator. I said, well, you know, Delve has made contact with this patient. She goes, well, I still have the cell phone number. I said, can you please, you know, call the patient's cell? She called me back in five minutes. She goes, oh, yeah, I found him, and he's doing fine. So, you know, it's, um, it's that level of uh, detail and manual help that's needed to really get those metrics down. Because, as you know, when you look at these big trials, everyone scrutinizes your loss of follow-up rate. So it has to be as small as possible from the acceptance of the clinical scientific community as well as the regulatory authorities who will review this as a submission. And those patients that are identified at risk are patients that are being followed, for example, um, you're talking to a relative or you're following their medical records. So again, you know, those you can't count on at the end to be there. So those were the patients that we put in the bucket of at risk. We had Dell work with those from day one, along with the site, whoever found them first won. So, so one thing that Kirby just said is following the patients and their medical records. And something that this trial was rather unique was during the conduct of this trial in the United States, electronic health records became ubiquitous. That was part of the Affordable Care Act. So we'd ask the sites to see if they could locate the patient through an encounter in the electronic health record if they were not following up with the site for the trial. It was interesting. That didn't really pay too many dividends because in many cases, the the physician at the site who was the investigator only had privileges at one hospital or two hospitals, and that was the only place they could look in the EHR for the patient, whereas the patient could have been seen at you know any number of hospitals or out of state or out of network somewhere. So we didn't really find that many patients in this trial who were potentially lost to follow-up from the EHR data source. But it was an initial foray that I think we'll iterate from and learn better how to do that in the future for future or ongoing trials or future trials. I think John has a question. So Kirby, you mentioned it a little bit in your comments about using the ACC databases to identify patients. And I think everybody's hoping that either electronic health records or these registries are going to help us identify, at least do high level screening to identify potential patients. This was a post-acute coronary syndrome trial, so some issues around timing. But can you speak a little bit more to that experience and sort of lessons learned and where you th see next steps in doing this kind of an approach to identify eligible patients? Yeah, so um, what we received was um, reports from the ACC, and they just didn't have enough detail um, to identify patients that met the inclusion criteria and um, within real time. We did provide these reports to the sites um, and we didn't have a single patient meet criteria for enrollment. Let me add, this was the Pinnacle Registry, which is an ACC registry for outpatients with cardiovascular disease. It's a voluntary registry. We don't believe that sites that are in that registry are submitting consecutive patients. And those sites don't match up particularly well with the clinical trial sites. So that was a th big problem. That was part of the biggest problem. So unlike a country that has a national health service like Sweden, where they have registries in multiple disease states where every patient with that disorder is in the registry and tracked in their national health record system, we don't have that in the US. So that registry was not fruitful for the purposes that we had hoped it would be. So it sounds like it's a not right sites. Uh, in the Pinnacle yeah. Registry, a little bit not right patient population, probably in the Pinnacle yeah. Registry, and then timing I, is the other thing. Yeah, because um, you had a, time, a limited time window to enroll these patients. But I can say that, you know, and we've presented about the adaptable trial here before and we'll do so in the future. In that trial, we are identifying patients from the EHR, from participating health systems, and I think we're actually going to plan another adaptable presentation in the fall, so we'll go over that in more detail. Um, I wanted to ask uh, Lynn a question on the CEC. So this was a programmatic CEC effort across 15 or 16 trials. The Odyssey Outcomes trial was the big one of all those, but there were 14 other trials, many of which closed and locked during the time that we're running the Odyssey Outcomes trial. Can you just talk about you know, that experience? Because it's an unusual one for the CEC group. That's not a common thing that we're involved in a program that way. And were there any special techniques that you used just to make the program run better versus the Odyssey Outcomes trial, which is the big player in that program? 
Well, we had a consistent ops team. That was very important, and consistent reviewers as well. So having, having the, the ops team um, be able to jump from study to study in an everyday processing of cases was very helpful because um, those smaller studies didn't have nearly the volume that the other ones did. I think the next study, we had 10,000, um, over 10,000 events. I think the next smallest study was a long-term study, and it only had about 400 events. But having the ability for the team who had been cross-trained, because we used, everything was the same, uh, we, were able to, we were able to use that same core team. So if something, they could, they could be still working on the outcome study, but then they could hop over to the non-outcome study and work, because it was the same, it was the same process. It did sometimes get a little bit crazy in that we would have, during those two interim analyses in 2016, it would, it, we were trying to lock, I think, a couple of the smaller studies too. So it was making sure we had the right people on the calls with the sponsor and that we were not just focusing on that one interim analysis, but we were looking at locking other studies. And anything that we learned from those other studies as we were locking or just doing the processing, we would share that across and, and, and also implement any changes to processes or that in the, in the large outcome okay. study. Um, Pierluigi, to follow up on that comment, can you talk about how we did QC across the program, knowing that most of the studies had fewer than 400 events, yeah. where the big gorilla had 10,000? How did we do QC that was then applicable to all the smaller studies as well as a larger study? The, the, the QC were really uh, program-wise um, that we did. Uh, and the, f the, the, um, the fact that we had, although the charter technical are not the same, but uh, in fact uh, the content was uh, 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 nearly identical and the particular definition were set uh, up front and they were um, Mm, the same definition for the uh, for the entire program, so that uh, we were able to uh, essentially essentially apply the result of uh, uh, QC from a different trial to the the whole okay. program and all the else. So, so it was, was really from a CC point of view almost like was one single yeah. trial sure. the where we uh, that we handle uh, also from review point of view we'll do at uh, committee maybe we'll start with the you know a few cases from a small trial because it was close to yeah. this lock and then move to the, the other one but for it was really um, a continuum of cases and um, and would uh, which were done um, essentially the, in the same way as it, it was the same in the same okay. trial F efficiencies of scale well, I think to wrap up, I'm going to ask each of the three of you to tell the audience your single most memorable experience from the overall trial. So, short and brief. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, if you, you, want, you want to hand it over to Kirby funny. if you... Uh, yeah. Well... I mean, just person when I saw the result the first time. Okay. Because uh, I mean, having run the CEC, uh, I was uh, uh, very anxious about you know. We, yeah. Hopefully, we did that we right. There was no, nothing weird going on there. So I think when uh, when I, I I saw the result, uh, I was very yeah exactly like I did like people that saw me the day of the execute me with the result that they saw Good. me very nervous. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure I have a single event, but of course, enrollment of the first patient, always an exciting time. And then um, when we did the data cut and um, we had really dropped those loss to follow up withdrawal consent numbers down to an incredible um, low level, that was a big highlight. Mm -hmm. I think for me it was it was reaching that 99% complete for the uh, for that second interim analysis. At that point, uh, we felt confident that going into lock that we had the right processes in place to achieve that kind of a number and to lock the database as quickly as possible. And I'll wrap up by saying my single most memorable experience was on Saturday at the ACC after the main trial presentation. We had the whole team together and had a celebratory lunch and being able to have everybody in the same room to thank them for what they did and see that energy, enthusiasm, excitement and the, the, the thankfulness that everyone had to be to actually go to the meeting and see the presentation live and the fact that we were able to do that and, and give that experience to everyone was the most memorable time that I had in the trial. So with that being said, I think we'll wrap up on time and thank you for attending and uh, 
if Kirby has one, one last thing. One last thing sure. is um, let's have everybody who worked on Odyssey stand up and see everybody in yeah. the room that sure. was involved. Let's do that. Thank, thanks again for attending, both here and those on the uh, on the online web-based viewing.